And we are live. So today we are um, with uh, Connie, uh, of the co-founder of BitGive. And thank you, Connie, for joining me today. How are you? Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I'm doing pretty well. Um, it's a, a crazy time, but doing well in these crazy times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, crazy it is. Actually, I was going to just pause one thing. All right, awesome. So yeah, so um, I like to get, I like to start by maybe first um, recalling where we first met. I'm trying to remember like the the uh, year or time frame. Do you remember? Um, I think we initially met just over email. <laughs> um, I reached out because we had a project in um, India on our MVP, um, and then we met in person at your event in Toronto. Um, but that was like several years later, I think. So. Right, right, right. So this yeah. is what, like 2015, 2016, maybe somewhere around there. I don't know. When we first connected. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Connie, um, so I guess like the first thing I wanted to would start with was your story before you, you know, got into Bitcoin or learned about Bitcoin. Um, I know it's uh, a bit of an illustrious path once you got into the industry and have a very interesting story. Um, but before you got in or learned about Bitcoin, just curious, what what were, I don't know, what was kind of like going on in your life at that time? Yes, well, um, I was, so I learned about it in around 2013. So prior to that, um, my whole career was um, focused on environmental work in California. So I, um, I grew up on the East Coast, but I moved to California when I started my career and was very focused on lots of different environmental issues and um, initially started out doing like impact analysis where if there's like a new project, you have to evaluate what the impact will be on the environment. Um, and then I shifted into urban forestry and working at a nonprofit in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. and um, and then shifted into policy work and advocacy work. So I was working at a consulting and lobbying firm. And I worked there for quite some time, almost seven years, and was really involved in California state policy on behalf of nonprofits. So um, a lot of what we worked on was also funding sources. So like on, in California, you can put a proposition on the ballot for public funding for different um, needs. And we, we as a firm would do a lot of those for natural resources stuff. Um, and then we would follow those through the whole process at, in California. So we would write bills. Well, technically we didn't write the bills, senators and assembly members did, but <laughs> we would help them write bills. Um, and we would hmm. follow you know bills through the process in the legislature, as well as working on budget issues and working with agencies at the state. So lots of different, angles but all focused on environmental issues interesting well i mean just curious what, what type of environmental issues were you mostly focused on uh i kind of grew a niche probably pretty early on in urban forestry and urban greening and then broadened it a bit into urban sustainability so a lot of the work i did was around trees in urban areas parks green spaces river parkways um, all kinds of things like that and how to have more funding sources for projects like that and better policies at the state level for those projects to be implemented. Um, all with the angle of, you know, sustainability, of course, is the way to go. And um, with a focus of um, projects in urban areas and making urban life more sustainable with not just greening, but also like transportation, uh, public transit, bike, biking, walking, um, all those sorts of things, um, which, you know, cumulatively create less of an impact on the environment and actually can become a positive over time. And especially for people working and working and living in more densely populated areas, um, it makes a huge difference to have green spaces in those places. Yeah, interesting. Hey, Connie, I think your video just paused on me. All right, so I think we got over that technical glitch. 
Um, okay, so so I guess the next question is what's what what next? So uh, yeah, what year are we in now? You said you're in 20 like 11, 12 time frame. Yes, yeah, so that was my um, previous career was 2000 until about 2015. I had a little overlap with BitGive and still working in the environmental field. So, um, so probably around 20, yeah, around 2013, um, mm -hmm. I left the lobbying firm and went to work for another nonprofit again in urban forestry. So. All, pretty much my whole career was nonprofit work, even if I was a consultant um, to them versus being staff at one. Um, because uh, when I was working at the consulting and lobbying firm, all of our clients were nonprofits. So it was uh, lots of work with nonprofits. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And then, and then how did you first, I guess, come across like Bitcoin or, or even this, this space? How did, you, did you hear about it like in some article somewhere or? No, I actually heard about it um, from my brother. So Tony, who was a, is a co-founder at BitPay. Um, hmm. So they started, I don't know if they officially started BitPay until I think it was 2011, but he was really interested and involved in the tech since like probably 2009, um, maybe 2010. So I started hearing about it through him. Um, but it was more like tangential to me, right? Like I had my whole life and career going I live in California. He's on the East Coast. Um, at that point, I was, you know, a senior level role in my career, and um, you know, I just thought it was really exciting um, what what was possible for with this technology based on like my, excuse me, minimum exposure to it. Um, I what I initially was grabbed by was the fact that you could access someone anywhere, anywhere in the world. As long as they had a phone, it could be a, one of those, you know, small feature phones um, that you could send them money <laughs> in the middle of, mm. you know, in the middle of nowhere in like a rural area in Africa, you know, um, that's what really grabbed me. And I, I felt like it was extremely revolutionary and very inspiring just from that one kind of perspective of it. Interesting, interesting, cool. So, so you had been hearing about it from from Tony for well, I guess for a couple of years then. I mean, in twenty ten. So by the time twenty thirteen rolled around, <laughs> um, he was probably at like uh, at like you know dinner parties, annoying everyone about Bitcoin, right? Was he like that <laughs> guy? <laughs> I tend to be that guy now, but <laughs> he's a little quiet. Um, you know, even mm. now he's pretty quiet. But yeah, he would tell everybody about Bitcoin, and. I I remember like mm. some of the early years before I got involved um, that he would come out to California for Bitcoin events of some, you know, whatever sort going on in San Francisco or the Bay. And since I lived out here, I would meet up with him so I could see him and I, he would like bring me along to these things for Bitcoin. Um, and I remember one time going to a small dinner in um, Japantown in San Francisco and um, that was when I first met, actually, no, I had met Jesse before that, but I met Jesse Powell in Sacramento actually before that, but he was at this dinner. And so was um, Jared um, Kenna um, and like some of the really early, super early guys. And we were all having dinner and somebody, I forget who it was, but someone said, you know, if the powers that be wanted to like, just wipe out Bitcoin right now. They could just come by here and, you know, take care of it. And I was like, oh, what? And then I got all worried. Like, what is my brother involved in? Like, what is this? What is going on here? <laughs> and I was like, Tony, what is he talking about? <laughs> so that was like kind of a wake up call. That was really early on though. Like probably 2012 or, or maybe even earlier. So, so uh, I guess just just to fast forward to the to like current time, what is your thesis on what the powers to be would think of Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> They're investing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's come a long way. I mean, it's interesting because the the headlines are still like trending towards the negative stuff, but 
from a like adoption standpoint, it's come so far. I mean, we have huge institutions and well-known, you know, financial institutions and like likewise mm. getting involved. Um, companies investing, um, you know, things like. Um, I mean, it's been a couple of years now, but it's still a huge thing is like the Sh Chicago, you know, mercantile exchange coming mm. in, like, just really big stuff like that going on. Um, it's yeah, come a very long way. Um, so I think, I mean, even though there's still some, you know, negative perspectives in like the more traditional institutions, I think mm -hmm. from the most part, it's being at least looked at with intrigue, if not embraced and adopted. So mm. yeah, no, so true. Anyways, just to go back, actually, just give me one second. All right. <laughs> so anyways, just to go back, forget the powers to be for a second. Um, uh, no, but okay. So, 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 but you had this like aha moment where you're like, okay, this thing might be useful in, you know, in, in places where maybe financial networks aren't, you know, readily available. Um, you know, you're seeing your brother build like business, actually even to this day, one of the most like prolific businesses in the space. Um, yeah. And and then I guess when does it all click or when are you like, okay, I think I need to do something within, you know, kind of this space and, and connect my passion and, and this. So that was unexpected, but quite like magical. Um, and I love telling the story because it was, it really for me, came out of the sky, you know, it was like, so basically what happened was um, in 2013, um, I was kind of, I wasn't really in between jobs, but I was switching from the lobbying firm to a nonprofit position again. And my brother was coming out for the, the Bitcoin Foundation's first conference um, in San Jose. And there had never actually been a Bitcoin found like Bitcoin event all about it's about Bitcoin. There had been other events where there was maybe a Bitcoin, you know, corner or stage or something um, like at CES or whatever. But this was like the first Bitcoin event. And at the time, it was May of 2013. BitPay had just gotten its first seed round. So it had been probably two years and Stephen and Tony were both leaving their full-time careers to really focus on BitPay. And they were hiring their senior level staff and they were gonna make a big splash at this event, this Bitcoin event. So um, I actually have to credit my mom for really strongly encouraging me to go. She was like, you really should go, you really should go. And I'm like, okay, all right. Cause it was kind of a trip for me to get down to San Jose and um, I had to take some time off from work and, you know, but I went down there really just to support him. Right. Just to be there, kind of see what's going on. Um, but that's when everything changed. It was so crazy um, because being in that space and in that moment in time was one of the most, I think, magical excuse me, moments of, of the whole Bitcoin industry. Like there was a lot of things that came out of that event that a lot of people were really inspired and BitGive was one of them. So I, um, there was a panel on nonprofits and Bitcoin. And I was like, oh my God, I have to go to that panel, right? And they were really just talking about how they might accept it as a donation or how they might use it on their books or something. And so I was like, okay, well, this is kind of interesting, but like, what about the big picture guys, you know? And cause I was sitting there thinking like, this could be huge for nonprofits and like philanthropy in general. And like, where is that going? And I started asking questions and nobody was doing that already. And so, you know, my gears were turning and then I came up with this, even with the name of BitGive and even like an image in my mind of the logo that it would be um, an earth with a, a leaf in front of it and BitGive, which is kind of like what our logo is now. <laughs> well, okay. um, and yeah, it was just like, it was just this moment where I realized like, if if no one is is doing this already, it has to happen. And I was so excited that Tony was off in a press interview somewhere and I couldn't tell him my idea. So I went to Steven and I'm like, I was so excited I couldn't wait, right? So I'm like, Steven, 
I really think that there needs to be a philanthropic institution. Like this is going to be huge. And, you know, the energy I was feeling at that event and the connections I was making to what I had done in my career, I just felt like this, this has to happen. Like, and I said, is anyone doing this already? Uh, and he looked at me and I don't know if you know, Steven, he's very, he's a man of few words. <laughs> he looked at me and he goes, no, no one's doing that already. He's like, and that's brilliant. You must, you have to do that. And I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> and it just kind of took off from there. I mean, it was really about being in that energy, right? Of that early energy where there were only a few startups that had actually gotten invested in at that point, right? Like BitPay, I think Coinbase had just closed a seed round too. Um, very, very few things getting started, uh, but the energy and the potential was huge. And there were really smart people wandering around in this conference, like, you know, developers and engineers from Silicon Valley, because we were in San Jose, um, lots of entrepreneurs, stars in their eyes, and a lot of investors as well, like kind of checking out the space, like what is this Bitcoin thing, you know? Um, and all of it just for me came together with like that we have, you have to do something where we can capture all this potential, all this energy and make sure that something good happens out of all this, you know? even if it's just siphoning off a fraction of the wealth to be had in this industry to give back. At the time, you know, the tech was so simple. It wasn't necessarily about leveraging the tech at that point, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I know I'm kind of rambling, but it was, yeah, it was just unexpected um, inspiration from being in that space and in that energy That's, I mean, and this is in you said what december 2013 no when did you say may, may, may of 2013 yeah <clears throat> interesting very interesting <laughs> because we did in december 2013 we did uh something called the global bitcoin conference uh i mean oh. we just we just named it that just because you know you could <laughs> and uh we did it at like a five-star hotel so it you know feels super official and that was where we launched uh you know uno coin <laughs> so 2013 oh. is kind of a, a you know a great year um, yeah but i was gonna say is, is you know when you said um that you know that day when the logo and the idea kind of just came to you what was it about i guess bitcoin the community kind of the um you know what, what was it about the innovation if you will that 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 made you go oh wait this is perfect for you know what is it and what was it perfect for for giving i guess i mean ultimately but uh for what like what was your kind of aha moment there yeah, so that was kind of, so basically at that point, you know, the industry was just budding, right? Um, it's come so far from that, from there. But at the time, it was really all about just the potential, right? Like I had already been inspired by what the technology could do as far as reach in, you know, remote areas and helping people was what I was inspired by. Um, and then seeing in that event, the, all the pieces were in place. You know, it was the perfect recipe for, not only was the tech obviously very revolutionary, but all the pieces were in place for it to be successful and not only successful, but huge. Um, and so my thought was like, this is the next dot com boom, you know, if not bigger, like this is gonna be huge because it's gonna revolutionize everything on a global scale, right? And so just the potential and the size was what initially made me think like, okay, we, ha we have to tie this back to nonprofits and philanthropy and giving back and make sure that as this industry grows and succeeds, that there's a place for making sure that good is happening, right? And at the time, it was really that simple, um, but it's, it's matured quite a bit now that, you know, the industry has grown, the technology has expanded. Um, and personally, you know, I didn't know much about the tech at that moment, right? 
So for me at that moment, it was about the potential. And now, you know, almost eight years later, <laughs> um, there's a lot, a lot more to leverage than just the potential, right? Um, yeah, Connie, so on a, on a slightly personal note, I was going to say that I had two experiences that kind of opened my eyes to the power of giving. One was I don't even remember exactly what year, but maybe 2012 or something. There was like a big hurricane that had hit New York. Yes. And it was so big that 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 I remember like servers in the financial um, services buildings were like flooded and it was like, it was really severe. I forget the name of it, but um, it was around the time I was getting into Bitcoin and I had some and I was living in India at the time. And I was thinking to myself, like I have friends in New York, like if I wanted to like, let's say help them. Like, let's say I wanted to like get them some sort of like yeah. money. I can't do it with gold, obviously, because you'd have to take it out of your, you know, your safe, sell it on Monday, take that money, wire it, wait like days and yeah. weeks. And, and, but in an emergency kind of like situation where you needed to get <clears throat> funds, I, I felt like Bitcoin offered this like perfect medium to, you know, transfer, transfer value from one person to another. Um, the other experience was when, like, I forget again um, the name, but there was this like earthquake that it hit. I think it was uh, Nepal, yeah. uh, where it was just like devastation and like pictures of oh, I don't even want to yeah. mention, but like just really, really sad. And we had really quickly, you know, found a contact in Nepal that could get money to the hands of the people that needed it, and. On the flip side, threw up a website, um, you know, I think it was called like Bitcoin for Nepal or something like that. And we had just quickly started, you know, collecting donations. It wasn't a whole lot, um, but still it was just like, it was amazing to me how, you know what I mean? How empowered I, we felt like, just cause like you could actually do something yeah, about it. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's so it's so it's so awesome. Um, so 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 what so what next then? So what happened? I guess in terms of like your you know your set of experiences, if you will, that eventually led you to you know starting an organization and yeah. you know like breathing life into this. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny like looking back on it now because it wasn't you know like I said it was totally unexpected to even have this idea. And then for it to be encouraged. So like Stephen thought it was an awesome idea. Then I told Tony that he loved it. Um, Stephen is the CTO, right? Of uh, or one of the founders, or, sorry, of BitPay? Stephen? Stephen, sorry, you said? Yeah, he was, he was the CTO and he now was, he's okay. the CEO. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah. sorry, continue, yeah. yeah. Tony and Stephen were the co-founders. Right, right, um, right. Yeah, and then their CFO was there, so he got all wrapped into my idea too. <laughs> and um, it just kind of quickly took off from there. Like a, we had a great time at the event. I met a lot of cool people in the Bitcoin space at that event. And then um, I went back home and I'm like, okay, well now what do I do? Cause I never started a business or anything. I had, you know, always had just traditional roles where you work for someone else, you know? Um, and so I thought, well, you know, I know a lot about nonprofits but I certainly never started one and I don't know the legal aspects or anything. Um, so the first thing I did, which is, I look back at our old stuff now and I just laugh, but the first thing I did was like, I learned how to make a trifold brochure in like word because <laughs> I'd never, you know, when you work for other people, like you don't have to create things from scratch, right? They're just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. somebody else does it for you or it's already there. I mean, so yeah. I was like, okay, well, how do mm -hmm. I even put this down on paper? Right. In like a way that I can share with people. So, mm -hmm. um, so I just tried to put the basic ideas down, you know, made a free logo online, like kind of stuff, and then kind of sent it back to Tony and Steven and Brian, who was their CFO at the time. And I was like, okay, guys, so this is basically what I was thinking, like, is this what you were thinking that would be a good idea, right? Just to make sure we're all on the same page here. <laughs> Um, and they were like, yeah, this is great. Like, let's get on a call. You know, they were super, super supportive. Um, and so from there, it, I realized, you know, started doing a lot of research and at the time there was no guidance for Bitcoin whatsoever in any agency, any financial institution, like this is like May, 2013. So I'm like, how do I start an NGO that can be global in scope, 
but financially, right? So I, I want to be able to receive donations from anyone in the world. And I want to be able to give back out to anywhere in the world. The latter is done, you know, has been done for years with international NGOs, but they often even still have to start separate offices in different parts of the world to do that, right? But the accepting funds from all over the world has never really been done before. And, you know, that's another reason why NGOs set up different headquarters in different countries because of all the legal stuff. And um, so I quickly realized like, this is way above my like knowledge base and I need some guidance and probably from a lawyer, right? As to like how to set this up in the best way. Um, and so we basically took it from there where um, Tony introduced me to uh, Patrick Merck who was at Perkins Coe at the time. Oh no, no, he wasn't at Perkins Coe. He introduced me to Perkins Coe. Um, Patrick was all excited and he said, I think this is an awesome idea. He's like, but I don't know nonprofit law. So I'll find you someone who can help you. And he introduced me to the Perkins Coe team that actually had Bitcoin people in 2013. <laughs> right. And then it just took off from there. They took us on pro bono and they helped us get everything set up because, you know, you really have to do a whole lot of like just boring paperwork stuff before you can really do anything else. Um, and yeah, I mean, and then, then they helped us get the first 501c3 status for a Bitcoin nonprofit. So we had IRS tax exempt approval uh, by 2014. Oh, <laughs> wow. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so that, that seems like a pretty, I don't know, big landmark, if you will, milestone moment. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. so, so now you've got this idea, you've got a logo, you've got um, a nonprofit, um, the government recognizes it, you've got your brother, you know, his business partners are, are, are buying into this vision. What, what, what next? What happens after that? Well, so we, um, we had to build a board, so we convinced Stephen to actually be on our board. So he was our founding treasurer. Uh, Patrick Merck was my founding president. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also had a good friend with a lot of nonprofit experience who joined as well um, mm -hmm. in Sacramento, Madeline. And so we started the organization. And then from there, the, the, the government um, approval, the initial approval was pretty easy, but this tax exemption takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So we started just doing a lot of exciting work in the meantime, waiting to see how that would go. Um, and so our first project was um, with Bitcoin Black Friday, and they were only in their second year. And they had at the time, they had like this whole thing going on. It's kind of died down a bit, but they had a lot of promotion and a lot of stuff going on. And I thought, these guys, like they have a lot of exposure, but there's nothing here for nonprofits. It's all about buying TVs and, you know, basically Black Friday stuff. And so I reached out and I was like, hey guys, like, this is cool, um, but, you know, could you like add charities to this? So while people are looking at what they can do with their Bitcoin, what things they can buy with their Bitcoin, that they can also see they can make a donation because it's the holiday season. Um, and they were like, oh yeah, that sounds great. So we did a campaign of BitGive did a campaign on Bitcoin Black Friday's website <laughs> and we raised money for the um, typhoon in the Philippines. So it was like the, the most, you know, imminent disaster relief effort at the time. And we said, okay, Bitcoin Black Friday is only one day and we mm -hmm. were new to all of this. So we had to keep it pretty simple for us too. And I was still working full time in my other career. Um, and so we said, okay, everything we raise in this one day from midnight to midnight, we will give to save the children for the Typhoon's Haiyan Relief Fund. And we ended up raising over $5,000 in that one day on the Bitcoin Black Friday site <laughs> for the Typhoon. Um, and it was funny because a lot of the effort while I, I was traveling in South Africa or South America, for the first Latin American Bitcoin conference. And I was sitting on the floor 
in the train station to get internet, basically trying to pump up donations to this campaign. <laughs> <laughs> in Patagonia, actually, I was in Patagonia. Yeah, <laughs> that is wild. That's crazy. That's crazy. What's uh? Wow. Okay, I didn't know all that stuff. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. So what what happened after that? How'd you guys? How'd you guys uh like move forward? So five thousand dollars. That's not you know a small amount. That's like uh. So what yeah. happened? After that? We were pretty excited to as a new nonprofit. And for one day only to raise that much, we were pretty stoked. Um, so yeah, so we reached out to save the children. They were like, Bitcoin, what's that? And we were like, it's fine, don't worry. We'll convert it for you because it's about helping people in a disaster, right? Um, but it started a relationship with Save the Children, which now has you know been eight years long. They were one of the first nonprofits to accept Bitcoin directly after that. We worked with them for about a year and they got really comfortable with it. They sold it up their ladder to everybody there. And they actually even participated in um, the Bitcoin Bowl. I don't know if you remember that, but there was a, a college football game sponsored by, it was really sponsored by BitPay, but it was the Bitcoin Bowl. Uh, and Save the Children went and had a tent of a tent there. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. I do remember that. I do remember that. I mean, I remember seeing it on the news or something, but yeah, yeah. cool. Okay. Um, and then we just, you know, continued from there. I mean, I, for about a year and a half, I was still working my other career because BitGive didn't have any money at all. It was just an idea that we spun up and thankfully had pro bono lawyers to help us file paperwork for, but we didn't have any funding. So I was still working my other job. So we basically just one time, one at a time, we would reach out to a nonprofit, we would build a relationship with them and we would do a campaign for them and raise money for them in Bitcoin. Excuse me. And actually our second campaign was with Medic Mobile for the earthquakes in Nepal. Interesting. So, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we did that for quite a while, probably the first three years, we would do one campaign at a time we didn't have a lot of staff or anything. Um, by the end of 2014 was when we um, had just enough funding that I could leave my job and focus on BitGive full time. And it was, <laughs> as with many of us in the space who've been around a long time, the price and the news headlines um, have put us all through quite a roller coaster ride. So we made this decision. The board offered me the position. I resigned from my job and then Bitcoin dropped by 60%. So <laughs> we were in a pickle because we we're unique in the sense that as a nonprofit that we don't, we receive the majority of our donations in Bitcoin and we don't immediately cash them out. We actually hold in Bitcoin still. Um, and so we were doing that and we were going to cash out as needed. And then the price dropped 60% right after I resigned from my other job and started BitGive full time. <laughs> so it was like, oh boy, well, now we have, instead of a year of funding, we have about, you know, maybe five, six months of funding. Wait, sorry, I missed that. So you guys had raised funding or you guys had gotten, okay, interesting. So how does that yeah, work? So we did a, we did a founding donors um, campaign. And we pretty much launched it around the time when we got the 501c3 status because we could then offer our founding donors a tax, a tax benefit, a tax write-off. Um, and it was sort of a watershed moment for the space to have an approved tax exempt nonprofit. So we ran a whole campaign to bring in our founding donors that would then give us enough money to have staff that were paid <laughs> <laughs> so that we could make it a real thing um, and not have me kind of, I was, I was still working honestly full-time hours on BitGive in addition to my other career. It was very unsustainable, right? Like I was working 80, 90 hours a week and only my paying job was paying the bills and BitGive was just fully volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, so it would never have sustained without being able to have staff and paid staff. So then um, what happened after the Bitcoin price dropped? 
Well, so then I was in an interesting position because I immediately had to start, you know, focusing on fundraising instead of being able to take a deep breath and know we had enough money for at least a year to focus on program and developing the organization um, because I immediately was in a shortage standpoint. Um, so we ran the, found, the founding donors campaign for quite a while to try to get ourselves back into a, a better place. And um, at the same time, we continue to run these campaigns, you know, one at a time. And for many, many years, that's basically all we were able to do. We had just enough money you know, like I, I remember saying to friends and family, like when they would ask me how it was going, I always would say, well, we have about three or four months of runway, <laughs> like, and we never really had, you know, and then something else would happen and a little more would come in. So I was able to keep going, but we never had a runway that was very long. Um, and then I guess it was 2015, uh, we decided, okay, well, you know, BitGive has matured, the industry has matured, this technology has matured. What's next for us? Like, what are we doing? And um, that we went through a sort of exploratory process of like different things we could do because we had to really pick one thing and focus on it because we were so small. Um, and what we settled on was give track was, okay, well, let's really embrace the technology itself Right now we're just doing fundraising in Bitcoin and then you know either sending it to them in Bitcoin or converting it. Let's actually leverage the technology and let's focus on the transparency aspect of it because that's really huge for nonprofits. You know, and at the time there were a lot of these headlines coming out about like billions of dollars going to Haiti and what happened to all that money? Where did it go? Nothing, you know, no evidence of impact kind of stuff. And so people were really starting to lose faith in nonprofits and think that it was just, you know, unfortunately a lot of fraud. Where my career of working with nonprofits before this, I know that, yeah, there might be some bad apples, but nonprofits are doing some of the most important and most critical work in our world and for people and the environment and everything that's most critical, who's, who is addressing those issues, right? largely nonprofits and mm -hmm. they struggle a lot to raise money and these bad apple situations create a big issue because everybody steps back and starts to question and then nonprofits struggle to raise the funds they need to do the most critical work they're doing you know they're bringing food to people clean water to people doing disaster relief helping with the environment saving endangered species like all kinds of really critical things we don't see for profits doing those things. We don't see governments doing those things. They probably should be, but nonprofits are the ones doing it, right? So when everybody steps back and doesn't want to give anymore because they distrust, it's a very big problem. Um, so essentially, you know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but <laughs> that's basically why we decided to tackle a transparent platform for giving with using this technology. And it took us uh, quite a few, few years to raise the money to do it and then build it. Mm -hmm. um, that's eventually what we did next was build the MVP for Gift Track. Interesting, interesting. O okay, uh, that, that's fascinating. Sorry, I... Uh... <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, no, it, you know, it's just because like, uh, yeah, because I mean, everyone always talks about like ICOs and raising money and, you know what I mean? And all these other aspects, but I, I find like this side of Bitcoin doesn't get a lot of, um, a lot of play, if you will. And so, so yeah. it's, it's good that we're getting to talk about it. Um, okay. So, so how, what is, what does give track look like then? And, and what kind of, I guess, like problem, you know, is it, is it aiming to solve and yeah. And how's that, how's that story playing out? So we, we've come a long way from our MVP. Our MVP was great, but you know, it was an MVP. So <laughs> we launched that in um, October of 2017, which if you know anyone who's been around in Bitcoin since 2017 knows that what a year that was. Um, <laughs> so it was quite 
serendipitous for us to have not only completed a technical product as a nonprofit and launched it, mm -hmm. but at this very serendipitous time when the price was just like peaking beyond anything we've seen since or before, right? Um, so we had several projects on our MVP that immediately got funded because of the price going up and people being generous. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, we need more projects. Like now we don't, we don't have anything for people to donate to because they're all funded, which was awesome. Um, and then come December of that year was the real peak when it went up to like 20,000. And I got this very suspicious, interesting email from this person called Pine from the Pineapple Fund. <laughs> And I don't know if you've heard about that. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, huh. And at the time I was in, I believe I was in uh, Bogota um, for the Latin American conference again. And I see this email and I'm like, this is really weird. And this person's like, I have 5,000 Bitcoin that I want to give away. Um, you know, can you help me with this? And I'm like, What's going on here? This is before the Pineapple Fund was public in any way. They were just emailing me. And I'm like, okay, I don't know who this person is. I don't know if this money's clean, where it came from, what's going on here. And they sent like a private message to prove they had the keys to the address. They sent the address to basically prove that they actually had this money, right? This is uh, movie well, level. This is yeah. movie level shit here. Okay, yeah, 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 continue, <laughs> continue. So, so you said 5,000 Bitcoin. Yes. At the time, Bitcoin was what? 20 grand? No. Yeah, it was, it was getting, ah. there. it was getting there. Cause this was like, you know, it went up so quick. So this was mm -hmm. early to mid December. So it was probably like around 12, 13,000 at the time, but then it just like kept going. Right. So, yeah. So I'm like, so Tony was actually at the same Latin American conference that year. And I sent him the email and I'm like, do, do you know, or can BitPay help me figure out where these coins came from? And if these are clean or what, what's going on with this money? And so he was like, oh yeah, you know, of course, like that's what they do, right? They have to screen everything. So he sent it off to someone at BitPay to do their thing with it. And he came back and he's like, it looks legit. Like, and it doesn't look dirty in any way or stolen or anything. And I'm like, okay, wow. Like now I got to pay attention. Like this is real. <laughs> Cause I was thinking it was some scam or dirty money or who knows what, right. I wasn't really taking it seriously. But, but that, but that's so interesting because like <laughs> normally if anybody was to write that to anybody, people would be like, no, that is crazy and probably delete their email or something. But the fact that that person was able to verify that they in fact did hold the private keys to those funds gave it a, a certain le level of, uh, you know, importance, if you will. Okay, cool. So then Tony does a back check. Yeah. Where are we now? And then I met someone at that conference that was in um, Europe who also actually had a, an AML company. So he was like, look, like I can actually give you a report, like an official report and scan these funds for you so that you have something you can show people. So it's not just BitPay's internal process, right? What did this pine, pine person or people or whatever want to give you? Uh, cool. Well, at the time it wasn't really clear. I. I don't remember if they offered, I think they might've offered us 500,000 from that first beginning, but I, it was, I ended up talking with this person. I still don't know who it is um, for months and negotiating with them, not just a donation to BitGive, but I was actually trying to get them to ha have us manage the whole thing for them. So I was totally like, you know, talking to my board, talking to lawyers and like coming up with pitches that I could, you know, get this person to essentially give all of this money to BitGive and let us put it out to where they wanted to see it go. Like give us some themes or NGOs that you like or whatever it is and let us process it all for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> they want it to be anonymous too. So it's like, how do you anonymously donate to like dozens of charities in Bitcoin? And so that was part of my pitch was like, if you give it to us, your lawyer can do it and we, we still don't even know who they are. 
but then we're the ones that's the known entity working with all the NGOs because you're, you're not going to be able to do this with all these NGOs. They don't know who you are. Um, so it was a whole thing, but in, in, I think in the beginning, and if not pretty soon after there was a, a, an offer to give us 500,000, which of course was like more money than we'd ever seen in all our years. <laughs> 500,000 what? $500,000? Yeah. yeah. And as a small nonprofit, like that was 10 X more than we'd ever seen ever, you know? Um, and this was 2017. So we'd already been doing all the things we'd been doing for four years and built a technical product as a nonprofit that was live and functioning and raising money for nonprofits, right? Like we had our MVP live we did all of this on a shoestring. Like there was, we never really had a budget or a team. So, so when this happened, I was like, oh my God, we could finally like, <laughs> like we can actually have a team and you know, we could build GiveTrack 1.0 and have a real platform, not just an MVP. Um, and it was like overnight because we had just launched our MVP at the end of October. So within a month or two, I suddenly have enough money to go build the real product. And it was just like, oh my God, you know? And then it ended up with Pine that they decided they wanted to do it themselves. So we didn't get the 5,000 Bitcoin to distribute for them, uh, but we did get another 500,000 from them in early 2018. So we ended up getting a million from the Pineapple Fund. Um, and they did give out, I think it was to 55 or 60 different charities they gave donations in Bitcoin too. So it was we just crazy. independently, independently, you mean? And, they, yeah. and how did they end up doing it? Did they just cash it out and send it? Like, cause I mean, how did those 60 charities accept it in the end? Just, they just took no, it? No, they did it in Bitcoin. Um, and they basically, whoever Pine is, assembled a team around them that was technical enough to support the nonprofits and get them set up. So they, most of them actually did it through BitPay. Um, because back then, that was really the only place that they could go to, um, which was a, another headache that I had to deal with because everyone was coming to us asking us, like, Pine wants to give us like all this money in Bitcoin. How do we do it? How do we accept it? How do we convert it? What's involved? And I'm like, this is why I wanted to do this for Pine. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, how do I help all these nonprofits when we're not resourced to do that? and we're not a payment processor, right? So I was trying to figure out like how to help everybody and Coinbase at the time had stopped helping nonprofits. And there were other exchanges, but honestly, it's pretty challenging as a nonprofit to get set up with any financial institution because in the traditional in in finance world, they're flagged as high risk anyway. And then you add Bitcoin to the situation so most exchanges and most companies weren't even working with nonprofits at all. So thankfully BitPay was. And so basically most of them went through BitPay and set up a merchant account essentially with BitPay so that Pine could make the donation in Bitcoin and basically receive that tax benefit as a, essentially as a capital gains write-off, right? Or offset, capital gains offset. But then the charity used BitPay to turn it into cash for them. So Hein was getting what he wanted by or she wanted by giving it in Bitcoin still. Um, but yeah, it was a huge effort. And I don't know how they got all that done, but somebody was helping Pine. I, it was at least two people. And they helped nonprofits. They were technical enough to help nonprofits get signed up so that they could give the money in Bitcoin. That is so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, that is crazy. It ended up being like $55 million that they gave uh, away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but, but I have a question. So in this process, like, did you not, I guess, in essence, uncover a totally untapped potential for like Bitcoin giving, which is like anonymous giving? <laughs> like there might be a lot like, is it even possible to anonymously give money today it is or is it not Actually, how does one go about doing it it's gotten a lot harder these days because hey, uh, Kanye, i'm just gonna just pause it one sec just give me one sec okay yeah okay awesome got that addressed um 
Okay, so that is like, that is such an amazing feel good story. But I guess my question was, was, yeah, so like, is that, is, how does, okay, how does someone give money uh, anonymously? So now it's, it's a little different, I think, largely because of the pineapple fund. <laughs> um, because there were some, some challenges with how that was done because of the high risk flags for nonprofits and the anonymity. So um, there was, you know, sort of a, a step back in the industry as far as like working with nonprofits at all, but also like being much more strict about the KYC and the AML and all of that. So it's not the easiest thing. And honestly, as much as we get, you know, people complain all the time about, you know, not just us, but any legit company in the space that has to follow these regulations. The, the, you know, real hardcore Bitcoiners, of course, point fingers and criticize, but it's, you have to do it. If you want to have a legitimate business and you don't want to end up in jail, you have to follow the rules. So it's gotten much tighter, I would say, but um, I don't know if you saw recently though, <laughs> very recently, um, there were some donations made by black hat hackers to NGOs in Bitcoin. And it was all over the news because it was not, you know, it was essentially dirty money in the sense that black hat hackers stole it from companies and then turned around and donated it to a nonprofit. And the nonprofits didn't know where it came from because they accepted it anonymously. So it was a whole problem basically. And then with Bitcoin, as you know, you can't just send it back. So what do you do with it then? So the hackers put these nonprofits in a really unfortunate position, you know? Mm. I don't know what they were thinking because if you're trying to help, you don't do that. You don't put them in a, in a tough spot, you know? Um, legally and also like if they wanted to return it, they can't. So then what do they do with it? And they use Bitcoin as well. These, oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So, anyway, so where does this where does this take us then? So, in terms of, so you get like a million dollars. Ask and you <laughs> shall receive. Um, it's almost. Yeah. Like, I, I remember reading about that, and I was just like, "That is super cool." Do you think you maybe? Uh, do you think it was maybe Satoshi? I don't know. This. <laughs> who was very early on and I'm sure was mining early on because they had so much Bitcoin they didn't know what to do with it and they were very technical because like we would talk about stuff happening you know helping NGOs get set up or if there was like a change in a wallet they knew about it like oh yeah I know this you know that was when we had all the bips flying around and like certain wallets did certain things and they knew all of it so I don't know, but the thing that that I, the message I got loud and clear from Pine was that they, whoever they are, they were very, very concerned about their personal safety and their family's safety. And they, that was the, essentially why they didn't want anyone to know who they were because they want, they didn't want to be at risk and they didn't want to put their family at risk by the world knowing how much Bitcoin they actually had. Um, so I don't, I have no idea who it is still. And it's been like, you know, four years almost. Um, it could be Satoshi. Um, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows who it is, you know? Um, they had a whole website and everything that's now gone. They let it expire the domain. So there used to be all the nonprofits that they donated to, the dollar amounts, links to the blockchain transactions, like everything. Um, but they let the domain expire and it's all gone. Um, and I can't reach them anymore either because their email was also connected to that domain. So I've tried to reach out and it doesn't work anymore. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 
it coin stories that, that that's got to top all the stories so far i think that that that, that is that's an awesome story i to, i kind of forgot about it but when, as soon as you started going into it i was like oh oh yeah okay so what's uh so what happened after that so i guess now you guys um you know you go and build give track you guys are in the process of bringing that to life now that's exactly so so we actually around the same time got another anonymous donation for a million dollars i don't know who that person is either yeah so we basically overnight i mean it took a couple months but pretty quickly we had two million dollars and then some because the price had gone up so much that we also had other donors that were making contributions the price was up so high um so yeah we basically just immediately started like okay well we have enough money to build a real platform now and let's go for it. And I'm a non-technical person, right? Like my degrees in forestry, my whole career was environmental work. I'm not a CTO. <laughs> so like, how do we build this platform? So we started just building a team and we went with a dev shop um, initially that we already knew and had a relationship with to help us build the first version. And it was quite, um, it was quite a heavy lift because we didn't have anything um, developed. Like we didn't have any documentation. We didn't know what our stack was going to be. We didn't, we knew we were going to start over from the MVP because it wasn't built in a way that we could just keep building on top of it. We had to start over. Um, so we had a lot of work to do. And as a non-technical solo founder, it was like, okay, wow, <laughs> you know, like, here we go. We're building a, a Bitcoin and blockchain donation platform, you know? Um, so it was all about building the right team to make it happen and really thinking through, like, how are we going to build this and how is it going to work? And from a legal standpoint, that was a tricky one too, because of, you know, money services, business licensing and money transmitter licensing we don't have any of those and it would have cost us two million plus to get that licensing so why would we want to be licensed like a bank right or a payment processor so we had to figure out how do we build a platform where bitgive does never 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 touches the money we don't touch it we don't convert it we don't hold it we don't transfer it we don't control it we never we're not touching the money so how does it go from the donor to the charity in crypto and be tracked on the blockchain and have like the whole shell of a donation platform with you know reporting and all of that and we're not ever touching the money we're just facilitating by building a platform so that was the hardest challenge we had really was like like really the nuts and bolts of how you would do that are you guys done now or getting close to an mvp of that or no, we have, we are done. We launched 1.0. We launched a year later. So December of 2018. Um, so now it's two years. We've had 1.0 up. Um, we have, I want to say at least 20 projects, probably campaigns with different NGOs are up on the campaign or up on the platform. And we've, you know, once we launched the first version, then we've been since then continuing to improve it and add new features and improve the UX and update the wallet and all kinds of things. So we've come a really long way actually. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a solid, solid platform and I'm pretty excited. Um, yeah, so that's essentially where, I mean, we have some new and exciting things happening now, but that's sort of the journey um, that is crazy. That is so wild. I love that. Um, <laughs> and then when did you come out to Toronto? You came out for one of our conferences that we were doing. That was in 20, wasn't it around 2018, 2019? I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we were, I think our MVP was still live and we were building 1.0. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. cool. So what, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess maybe, I don't know. I, I, by the way, it's already been like an hour and 15 almost time yeah. flies, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but I was going to say, what, so what, I guess since then, like, you know, what kind of, uh, I know you've got a conference that's coming up as well, but like, what have been some of the key, I guess, milestones? And by the way, I don't want to, um, I don't want to rush it either. Uh, if you're, if you're interested, you know, we can maybe do this again, like, like a follow-up or something, you know, before your, your event or after your event, whatever. But, uh, but definitely, but yeah. So, what, 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 I guess, yeah. From, from, from that point on, like, how does, uh, how did things play out for you guys? So yeah. So we, um, what we've been doing for the last few years is improving the platform and onboarding more and more NGOs and exciting projects. And our most recent big improvement this year was we added uh, BitGo as the wallet for ch- charities. So we initially had BitPay, but it was their open source um, wallets, and, which is great, you know, for someone who's comfortable with the technology. It's not so great for a newbie and an, and an institution that really needs those funds to be safe and secure. So we basically did a huge overhaul to get an institutional wallet integrated entirely across the whole platform. And now um, we're also not having to hold backup keys because that was like something we really didn't want to (laughs) do. And from a legal standpoint, it was fine because we only had one and we couldn't do anything with just one, but still not something we want to be doing is holding backup keys. So so that was a huge thing. And um, now we haven't announced it yet. Actually, it just went live today and we're still testing it. I'm so excited. We, for years, what we've wanted is a credit card option for people to make donations. And we were never able to find anything out there that did fiat to Bitcoin through an API. Most of them do the opposite. They do Bitcoin to fiat, right? We wanted to bring in a mainstream audience to show them what this technology is capable of, how exciting it is, and not have to have them go and buy Bitcoin before they can use GiveTrack. So we now have live, and hopefully it's being it's being tested right now by the team, uh, Wire, W-Y-R-E, and they have a credit and debit card option, and they, through their API, make an auto conversion to Bitcoin, and they send Bitcoin directly to the charity's wallet on our platform. So again, we're never touching anything. We're not converting anything. Um, we're just facilitating the relationship between the donor, wire, and the charity. So I'm very excited about that because I think we'll bring in a lot more users and actually expose people to the what this technology can do. So I'm pretty excited. Um, and then we also um, have two new NGOs that we're launching with, which are very exciting ones. I mean, they all are, but... Um, today we launched with Heifer International, which is like very well known international NGO that's been around for 75 years now. So we're very excited to have them on our platform. Mm-hmm. And next week, we'll be announcing uh, another campaign with Black Girls Code. So we're pretty stoked about that. Um, and they're going to be raising money for computers for their girls, but specifically for a cryptocurrency curriculum and class. So we're Whoa. pretty yeah yeah so we have a lot going on <laughs> and then you mentioned the event as well but i'll pause D- defi <laughs> yeah yeah so should i go into that please yeah okay so yeah so this event um it's shocking how much we have going on right now because we also with covid had to scale back i think like everyone did so I'm like, how are we doing all this? But um, we are launching an event next week, actually, a virtual conference called DeFi, like you said, and DeFi as PHI for philanthropy. Love it. (laughs) Yeah. That I can get into. (laughs) uh, It's pretty exciting. And actually, Justin on our board came up with the name. So I have to give him props for that. It was uh, very clever. Um, so we've been working very hard. We pulled this whole thing together in like less than two months. Um, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers, including yourself, and we're super excited for it. Um, we have a full day, uh, I think over eight hours of content packed in, um, speakers from all over the world. So we have 
speakers in the US, in Canada, yourself, we have Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. So we're spanning the whole globe essentially in the course of like this eight hour um, time frame. And everyone who's speaking has done work that's it's spent like specifically within not just philanthropy, but nonprofits or social good or set or leveraging the crypt cryptocurrency for good or blockchain for social impact. So the whole entire event is themed around how this technology is today, right now, giving back, doing good, and having real impact in the world, not just in theory and not just, you know, in pilots or, you know, um, ideas, but in real, real projects and real companies and real nonprofits around the world. Very cool. Very cool. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be fun. What's the uh, date again? November? Uh, November, what's the exact date? November 18th, next November week. November 18th. All right, all right. Yeah. I, and by the way, I was going to say Bogota. So I, we, my, my wife's from Bogota. So we've been, we, we've oh. been uh, quite often. So I'm a big fan. You mentioned that earlier. I was going to say it, but I didn't want to interrupt. Um, you know that. Yeah. Father's wife is from Bogota. Really? Sister, yes. <laughs> no way, no way. There you go, small <laughs> world. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, okay, so, so, um, there was a, there was a, I guess, in terms of uh, like Big Give and Give Track and the project itself, was there anything else you wanted to you, you share? I guess just in, in kind of like before we move on to the, the final, uh, you know, few, few questions here. Um, it's a good question. I mean, we covered a lot. So I'm like, did, uh, I think just, you know, to keep us in mind, you know, for the event, it's free. We'd love to have people sign up and attend. And to keep us in mind as we start sort of head into the giving season, we have Giving Tuesday coming up on December 1st, and then the whole holiday season, as well as tax write-offs. And a lot of people don't think about that until April. It's too late to do it in April. It has to happen during the tax year. So anytime you need to offset capital gains or get a write-off or anything like that, it has to happen before the end of 2020, December 31st. So keep us in mind, we have that C3 status, which we talked about. So that means we can issue um, US donors a tax benefit. And um, we also have all these awesome projects on our platform on GiveTrack that they can also donate to, so. And if Pine's listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Thank you, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I mean, Dr. Pine. Yeah, huge thank you. Um, we would never be here and have done the things we've done. I mean, like I said, until then, we only had like three or four months of runway at any given time. And I was always kind of like, should I be looking for a job? Like, I don't know, you know, I don't know what's <laughs> Yeah, so big change when they came along. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Okay, so I guess, um, we, did we do the contrarian question? What's one thing that you believe in Bitcoin that um, the most others would uh, would disagree with you on? I, still, I don't think we can. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, is there something there that that? Uh... Yeah. Well, so <laughs> so one of the things I've noticed the minute I got into this industry, um, because it was so blatantly obvious to me. Um, is that we, we have a, a pretty severe lack of diversity and um, I mean, across the board, not just gender, but that was my, what hit me in the face initially because in the environmental field, there's plenty of women and they're partners at firms and they're in charge and they're, I mean, it's not an issue at all. And I came into this space and I'm like, there were- I Where are the like, ladies at? There was no one. Like, <laughs> conference that I had the idea of bit literally only remember Stephanie Murphy and mm. interviews on the floor of the convention and um I'm forgetting her name now but the woman who runs um anti-war they were like literally the only women I remember seeing there and later in social environments I saw a few more but there was no women there and so to me, it was so shocking. And I started realizing like, 
this is a problem. And the more I got involved in the industry and we started having conferences and events, I would go to their website and I would just see all men, no, not a single woman speaking at this conference. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, this is a big problem. And so ever since I noticed this, I, it was, has been sort of my pet project on the side of just like, I'm not just starting this organization. I'm trying to be a voice for like, we need to change this in this industry. And for many years, I was a lone voice or had a couple of, you know, other voices with me kind of screaming into the wind about this stuff. Um, once the industry grew in 2017, thanks to the price, but you know, we, the industry exploded, a lot more women came into the space and they also started noticing the same thing, go figure, right? And so then there were a lot more voices about this. Um, it's still a pretty controversial topic. It's still something that people get attacked about if they mention it, um, especially on crypto Twitter um, or anywhere, um, but it is very real. I mean, you just, it's so obvious if you just look around what is going on. And I guess the, the, the main key point that I try to always make is that it's not that there aren't women in the space. There are, it's that they are not given those opportunities to be put in front of the world. So if there's a conference and you see no women speakers, there are obviously women in the space who could be speaking at that event, right? Why is that not happening? And it just perpetuates on itself when you do those kinds of things. And that's been my main message is like, hey, get some women. There's obviously lots of founders, CEOs, co-founders, technical people, marketing people, you name it. Get them up on these stages and get them in front of people so that we have a presence that is of diversity and we bring in more people from doing that. You know, wouldn't we want to bring in more diversity, not just women, but in general? So that's kind of my main my main message. And this, you know, I'm sure you know with Bitcoin people it doesn't always go over so well. You know, they wanna argue about it. They wanna have different points of view about it. And I'm sorry, it just is what it is. These are facts like we need to do something about this. It's not healthy as an industry and for as humanity, right? It's just not a good, it's not a good thing. So yeah, so um, I definitely have seen things start to change and definitely for the better, but there's still a lot more we could be doing. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know where or when it was. I, oh yeah. I think it was, a, it was a long time ago. I learned this. I don't even know if it's real or not, but I, I, I heard somewhere that when something good happens, um, like to, to a woman, they share it on average. Oh my God. It's like, it's a versus a man is like women tend to share good news way more than men. So it'd be nice to have more women uh, sharing about Bitcoin. You know, the other thing, the other thing that um, I used to be like a, a financial advisor a long time ago. And the one thing I kind of witnessed um, having kind of sat with a lot of families, like hundreds, if not like thousands of families is that in households where the woman kind of manages finances, um, they tend to look a lot healthier than the ones where where the man does it. And that's just again, you know, I'm a man, so obviously that that that's a bit of a you know insult to to all men out there. But it was something that you know the data doesn't lie. I I don't know if you've ever heard of Muhammad Yunus as well, like his whole. Um, I actually met him as well. I talked to him about Bitcoin just just briefly, um, but but but. In his bank, in, in 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 kind of the Grameen Bank, they actually only lend to women, uh, which is insane. And and it's like, what? Like, why would they do that? But they never have a problem with getting their money back. <laughs> so, yeah, I can keep going. I have two little girls at home, so I definitely want I want more. And I try and in my whenever I do events, at least I try and make uh, like an effort to make sure that. You know what I mean? That because you want, like you said, you want, I think, diversified, diverse, diverse opinions. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> Again, I know in engineering school as well. It was like all dudes. It was like the worst ever. <laughs> it's like, and with with Bitcoin, it's the intersection of like tech slash engineering and mm -hmm. finance. 
see mm. two very male dominated industries kind of converging in Bitcoin. And yeah, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I did really early on, which I've now passed on to others, but is I started making a list of women in the space who were leaders and could be speaking at events. And I would actually stay up like really late at night. This is when I still had two jobs. I had my paying job and BitGive. I remember staying up really late at night many times because I was so infuriated. And I would email people having events and be like, hey, so I noticed like you could use a little more diversity in your program lineup like here's a list I put together of women in the space like hint hint yeah, I'd love to take a look at that list for my you know lineup of people I'm interviewing but uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah for sure for sure I think I totally agree with you hey, hey Connie I was gonna say if people want and by the way I have like a million more questions I want to ask you okay but I also want to be mindful of your calendar and uh and and you know and leave people something to kind of look forward to and we chat again next hopefully sooner than later <laughs> Um, but where, if people want to, um, you know, learn about BitGive, if they want to follow you, contact you, how do they, how do they do that? Okay, sure. So we have, um, we have our website, which is bitgivefoundation.org. We also have GiveTrack, which is where all our NGO projects and campaigns are. It's givetrack.org. And then um, we have, we're on all social media. So we have um, Twitter, of course, where every, all the crypto Twitter people are. <laughs> And then we have um, Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Um, we have Instagram, but we don't really keep up with it. So, um, and our general email is just info at bitgivefoundation.org. So you can email us there. By the way, if someone starts chatting with you on Instagram and they look like me, it's probably not me. Because there <laughs> lately there's been some scammers out there trying to like uh, you know pretend. I don't know, it's so weird. But I, I usually don't message people on Instagram. So that'll be your first warning. Okay, this has been super fascinating. Um, Connie, I, I'm looking forward to your event on the 18th. Um and yeah, and I was going to say, was there anything else, I don't know, that you wanted to share in closing or should we maybe uh, wrap this one up and no, I think close? Come, come, everyone should come to our event. It's free. <laughs> cool. Cool. Okay, perfect. And they can learn more about that event on uh, on your website, right? Yes, actually, that is bitgivefoundation.org forward slash conference 2020. Conference 2020. Okay, perfect. Cool. And I'll try and maybe if you send me the link or whatever, I can put it in um, in the section below. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So we'll chat again soon.